This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by the GTEC Blockchain Contest. If you have an idea for a blockchain related project, make sure you apply for your chance to win awards for 50,000 euros. Go to epicenterbitcoin.com slash GTEC, that's G-T-E-C, to learn more about GTEC and how you can apply. And by Hi.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first class VPN. Go to Hi.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Kujua. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are going to talk to Maciej Olpinski, who is a media consultant. Uh, Maciej has come up recently with a series of blogs that, that present a very unique view into content discovery, uh, the scarcity of attention, and how blockchains can be used to create open marketplaces for trading money, attention, and reputation. I, f- I found, while reading through these blogs, I found it a really interesting topic, and therefore we'd like to talk to him and flesh out his views on what the blockchain can enable. But before that, let's have somewhat of a background from Maché. Maché, what's your background? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so uh, my background is in uh, media platforms. Uh, I worked uh, for Google for many years. Uh, I started with AdWords, uh, then I moved to YouTube. So I was very close to the, uh, to the business model and ec- economics of these marketplaces. So I was working with advertisers, helping them uh, to spend their money more wisely, uh, and then with the creators and helping them to kind of maximize their um, uh, profits from, uh, from YouTube. Uh, so I'm quite familiar with how the advertising bi- uh, business works uh, behind the scenes. I got a question for you. That, I mean, it's just sort of broadly speaking. Uh, how many people, or I guess, what what is the sort of percentage of YouTubers that are actually making money and able to make a living off just YouTube advertising? You know, uh, like the joining the partnership program, basically, which allows you to monetize uh, your YouTube videos, uh, has a pretty low barrier. So it's very easy to, to enter the program, but... Uh, to actually make money on selling uh, attention, like selling ads, like these pre-roll ads that show before the video. Uh, if you go into hundreds of thousands uh, or millions, that's where you start making real money. Uh, aside from that, if you're smaller, you can still strike deals, uh, like direct deals with the advertisers. Uh, and that's maybe a bit more profitable. So let's let's go into one of the one of the core concepts of of your thinking, and I think that is captured by the statement uh, you made in your blog, which is the primary scarcity of today's world is attention. Can you elaborate on that sentence? What does it mean? Yeah. So uh, when I was looking at the the entire concept, because in the blockchain in the Bitcoin space, there was a lot of thinking about how we can decentralize. Uh, YouTube, how we can decentralize Facebook, basically apply the same model uh, that we apply to Bitcoin and try to extend that to the media platforms and uh, and create better monetization options for creators and new business models for content monetization. So what I realized that a lot of this thinking is based on the buyer-seller model, which is of course, it's, it's present online. It's the iTunes model or the Amazon model where you have buyers and sellers. However, the Facebook and the, the Google model are based on uh, three other scarcities. It's like uh, the scarcity of attention. Uh, basically, you have users who provide attention to the platform. You have creators who build reputation on the platform, provide their content. And you have advertisers who uh, bring in money uh, to the platform. Uh, and basically, the scarcity of attention is uh, just one side of this model, but the observation is based on uh, the relationship between the amount of content that we have online and the trajectory the amount of content is on is basically growing exponentially and the amount of human attention that is able to consume it. So when you extrapolate <laughs> this exponential curve, you're seeing that you know in a few years' time, and especially right now when AIs are creating content already, uh, there will be a huge competition for our attention, which is finite because we are limited by our biology with the amount of time we have and the amount of uh, labor our neurons can uh, you know, have during the day. 
Mm. Basically, attention is the labor of your neurons. You know, it's a real scarcity. <laughs> Do you think we're in a in a content bubble though? Is, 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 do you think that at some point you know people just stop cre- producing content because there's just so much content and no more value in creating it? No, I think there's a lot of value in creating. I, I think the competition for your attention will increase. So uh, the question is how we can align the economics of attention, content, and reputation, and money, and how we can create marketplaces which allow us to um, allocate this scarcity more efficiently. Uh, right now, we have these marketplaces uh, are controlled by companies like you know Google, Facebook, Snapchat, Reddit, uh, which are intermediaries between these scarcities, uh, and they have their investors. They have uh, people who want to make profit from them. So uh, they regulate. Uh, you know the, the markets are not really transparent, and I think there's a lot of experimentation we can do around that. Mm-hmm. Having the blockchain technologies and you know innovations, uh, you know like Ethereum, Bitcoin, and IPFS, and so on and so forth. So the key takeaway from 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 this section is that we should tend to think of media platforms as marketplaces, like you know, a normal marketplace. And there are many different uh, ki- kinds of uh, there are many different entities participating in a media platform and each entity brings something that is valuable so a user the the thing of value that a user is bringing is just attention that yeah. is his product right? yeah it depends like it's a every side of the marketplace if you look at and it's not something that was invented by google or facebook it's something that's been going on for many years uh, you know um, going back to the kind of old institution of patronage uh, you had wealthy business people and you had poor artists and artists had reputation, they were creating stuff. Uh, so they had uh, different scarcity and, you know, arts and business were always together. Celebrities and business, you know, always close to each other. Uh, so the, this exchange has been always going on. Uh, you know, artists want, uh, they, they want the money <laughs> and uh, the business people, they want reputation. They want to be associated with people who, uh, who have reputation. And, you know, newspaper business, uh, you had a publisher who was aggregating attention and building reputation over time <laughs> and then selling access to this audience uh, via print ads, for instance. And then Google took this model and Facebook took this model and made it more efficient and uh, made it work at scale. And it worked pretty well over the years, I would say. Uh, however, we are reaching the, I, what, what I'm saying is like kind of the peak advertising. Um, and this model, this model is breaking up. It's basically, my observation is that the return on attention <laughs> in many cases uh, is quite low for many of the users. They are kind of excluded from that. Uh, they are the least, uh, I, will, I would say, uh, kind of the weakest element uh, in this equation. Uh, that's they're why least you, rewarded. They're the least rewarded. They're least rewarded. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's why you have ad blocks. Ad block is the response to that. You know, uh, uh, if my return on invested attention is low, I'm using ad block and I'm increasing my return on attention because I don't have to pay attention to all these ads and figure out they're all consuming my uh, you know mental resources. So I'm just filtering well, this out. You know. I would say, Mayor, to add to what you were saying that well. Uh, a user brings its, his attention, but I think in a, in a broader uh, scale, the user also more, more and more is bringing value to conversation around topics. So, for example, like on social media or, yeah. or the content platforms, the user will also bring value to conversations that happened around that content. And it's unclear now how that can, how, how that can be monetized or if there's any value for the user in, in the conversation that he brings uh, to a piece of content. Yeah, what I would say, like, because, you know, I'm basically describing now a very idealized model. Uh, so when the web first started, uh, you know, the web 1.0, the web of documents, uh, this distinction was very clear. You had users, then you had publishers, and then you had advertisers. As we are moving towards models like Facebook, um, the creators and the, you know, you are both a creator and consumer right? you, 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 at the same time. You are creating content, so you are a creator, and then you're consuming content. You are basically consuming content created by others and giving them likes and giving them reputation. So you are acting in these two roles. 
And what I think that's gonna happen with the blockchain, the models that we'll be talking about, uh, the user will have, uh, will become the advertiser as well, will have the value and will be investing value um, because right now the advertisers are the separate category. Most of the participants are on Facebook, for instance, are kind of users and creators, but they are not really advertisers. This is the separate category and it's going to change uh, once we have Bitcoin and you know, other cryptos. I think it was the I think it was the Periscope CEO that I heard say somewhere that the you know the user is the content. You know, the this is where we're where we're heading towards. Yeah, like user is the content if you are the middleman who is gathering this data and selling this uh, because you know for the advertising the, the problem with the um, the existing model is that um, for it to work the platform operators have to collect data because the more data you have, the, uh, the more return on investment you can provide to the advertisers uh, because you can target ads more efficiently. So the more data you have, um, the less you pay uh, for, the, for ads because you know, if I know what you like, what your preferences are, I can uh, target ads more efficiently. So this model is unfortunately based on data collection um, of course, no one's interested in your personal data. And, you know, I've seen that firsthand. No one cares what's your name <laughs> because, you know, you're only valuable in the ag aggregate. Uh, your, your, your profile is, is what's valuable. However, from the privacy perspective, this, like, these companies have to, have to collect this data. And, uh, you know, it's unsustainable in the long term, you know, in my view. Once we hit the kind of exponential curve. Okay, so, so so let's let's get into your your models. And um, in your writing, you have covered uh, you've actually covered various different models. Like you have uh, you have explained what what how the way how Google works, how Facebook works, and how these models could be changed. So for only the purpose of this conversation, I think we should pick like one of these models and see what kind of change is possible, right? Because because uh, that would allow us to anchor into something. Uh, and 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 perhaps uh, we'd like to pick Google for it. So yeah, let's use YouTube for it because it has it has creators. They create videos. You guys also create uh, content for YouTube, and you know this will be a good example, I think. Okay, so um, so let's use use YouTube now. How does content discovery uh, on YouTube work? Like, what is content discovery, and what how does it work? Uh -huh. So uh, the content discovery is like. You know, basically in the economy that we're now, uh, the discovery will be always based on some reputation system. So on YouTube, like if you're using YouTube search, uh, the discovery will be based on, you know, how many links you have, how many views you had, how many subscribers, um, what kind of uh, tags you have on your video. However, in the kind of more uh, social way of discovering, uh, this will be based on like who are you following, uh, which YouTubers uh, appeared in each other's shows. So there are many ways of discovering content on YouTube. So for example, in, in YouTube, we have, uh, we have the users that are uh, selling their attention. Basically, you have the content creators and you have the advertisers. Yeah. And uh, we have sort of this link structure, like you said, right? That... Um, Videos linked to each other, the uh, users linked to each other ah, by subscribing yeah. to to, yeah. to contents. So, is it the case that this link structure is actually the uh, the heart of how YouTube works? Yeah. So yeah, now now I understand uh, your question. So yeah, so every social platform, and I would say you know even the web with hyperlinks, Facebook with likes, and YouTube with subscribers has has its internal model of transactions. So, you know, basically users can uh, subscribe or users can like something or I can hyperlink, you know, some website from my website. And so it all creates a kind of a local reputation system that's, that's used for uh, discovery. Uh, so my observation is that uh, these are all local uh, kind of link structures that are 
assigned to a particular platform. Uh, however, when you look at the Bitcoin blockchain and essentially like, you know, in blockchains in general, the transaction structure uh, between addresses uh, can be considered like a link structure like we have on these social platforms. And this can be used, for, uh, you know, and this the link structure is also used for discovery already. So we have these companies like, uh, you know, Coinalytics, Chainalysis, which are basically parsing the Bitcoin blockchain. Of course, they're doing this to discover, you know, fraudulent transactions, maybe the fraudulent transactions, they want to kind of sell compliance services to the banks. Uh, whether you consider it, whether that's good or bad for Bitcoin, uh, you have the reputation system on the blockchain the same way you have a reputation system uh, and the link structure on YouTube. They are just used for different things. Let's take a short break to talk about the GTEC blockchain contest. GTEC, the German Tech Entrepreneurship Center, is a new center in Berlin for entrepreneurship and they want to support exciting projects happening in this space. So that's why they're running a blockchain contest together with RWE which is one of the largest energy companies in Europe and Globumbus, a foundation supporting entrepreneurship. You can participate by submitting your idea for your project and win up to $50,000 in free grant money. That's equity for you. Just take the money and do what you want with it. Uh, anybody can apply, whether you're a, a, an early stage startup and perhaps you just have an idea, a blossoming idea, and, uh, or you can apply if you've already raised funding and are well on your way to becoming the next uh, multi-billion dollar company. And anybody can apply, whether you're in Berlin, in Siberia, in Shanghai, or in San Francisco. Uh, there's no geographical restrictions, and anybody who applies can win up to 12 months of free office space in Berlin, uh, free mentoring, legal support, etc. Of course, that's totally optional. If you want to stay in Siberia and work on your blockchain startup, you can also do that. The application deadline is March 31st, so make sure you submit your idea as soon as possible. You can learn more about the contest and apply by going to epicenterbitcoin.com slash gtech, that's G-T-E-C. And we hope you'll win, we hope you'll make it to Berlin to collect your money and that we'll get to hang out in person. Now we would like to thank uh, GTech, RWE and Globumbus for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So actually, let's let, let's take an example to 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 clarify it, and let's take the example of this channel itself, Epicenter Bitcoin. Now, like at Epicenter Bitcoin, we are we are creating content, and and ideally, as you're saying, like we have to think of Epicenter Bitcoin, any content creator, as be as trying to build its reputation, or trying to get trying to communicate to other people that hey here's something that's valuable and follow us listen to us uh, and yeah just like consume our content right and uh, the higher reputation we have the, the more people we we like to uh, that will follow us and what kind of starts to become important to us is that somebody tweets our our video let's let's say we make a video with you and somebody on twitter tweets this, this video 10 times mm -hmm. so um so basically the act of somebody else tweeting that video generates reputation for us because somebody will see his tweet and come to our channel the problem maybe not a problem it's a feature of twitter and it's good to use these platforms the the problem is that um uh, Epicenter Bitcoin uh, has many identities online. There is uh, YouTube Epicenter Bitcoin, there is SoundCloud Epicenter Bitcoin, there is iTunes Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, all your identities, uh, so what I'm arguing in my articles is that uh, your content is, uh, your content can be copied. I can go to your channel and copy your video uh, to my channel. And you know, it's gonna be as valuable. You know, few people will have you know, the same show, but what's important is the link structure. And the list, this link structure is locked within YouTube, <laughs> locked within SoundCloud, locked within iTunes. So you cannot take this link structure out with you and you don't control this link structure. So uh, all these reputation systems are, are locked. Uh, but at the same time, and this is the example I can um, maybe use to make it more clear, uh, you have your tipping address, yeah, on your... Uh, uh, in your description below the video on YouTube. So you have your tipping address and you are collecting tips. So imagine now, like, uh, 
you know, we'll, you will have a commercial break. Like we have, you have these commercial breaks. So somehow you are selling this uh, reputation that you have, uh, this very abstract reputation that was built on all these platforms. You're selling this to advertisers. Probably you do it directly. You have a deal with someone. Somebody's like paying you to reach your audience. Uh, but this you have to do directly. So imagine if you would use this tipping address, and you can make this experiment even, even uh, on the show, that you will say that uh, now you are se selling uh, 10 second slots on your show, uh, or like 50 word slots, uh, and from the blog number X, whoever sends you a transaction uh, with the link in op return, or you can even use the blockchain info public notes. <laughs> you know, they have a feature when you can attach the note to the transaction. And, and basically you can start selling uh, your ad space <laughs> on the Bitcoin blockchain using a very simple system. People can pay you for these slots and attach links uh, with a message or with a link or with whatever they want you to read. You can even create a simple auction system where you say like, if I receive more than, you know, uh, 10 offers, I will choose the ones with the highest bid, or you can use the timestamp as a ranking factor. Uh, so suddenly you are able, and people uh, will have this reputation of you because, you know, collected via Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, but suddenly you will have this avenue on the Bitcoin blockchain where you can actually start selling this. People can start linking to you. Um, uh, on the platform, which is not owned and controlled by anyone else. I don't know if that uh, maybe gives you a better understanding of what I'm trying to convey here. Yeah, I mean, so the idea here is uh, that you would use a Bitcoin address attached to a piece of content uh, in order to send value to, um, to that piece of content. Uh, and what you're saying is that by having it on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, regardless of whether your content lives on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, your website, or Medium, or w one of these multiple platforms where people produce content and publish content today, the content is attached to uh, uh, a canonical YouTube, uh, Bitcoin address. And that canonical Bitcoin address is where people send what they feel the content is valued at. No, they actually, they, uh, they don't even tip you. They, um, I would, you know, you can use the example and that's maybe even a better example of the Genesis block and the Satoshi's kind of address. Everybody's considering this is owned by Satoshi. And if you go to blockchain.info and check this uh, address, there's a lot of transactions that are <laughs> being uh, sent there uh, with public notes on blockchain.info and people are advertising their sites. Uh, why are they doing this? They are doing this because uh, this address has reputation. Like they know that these people are looking at what's happening at this address, uh, and they are basically trying to, uh, you know, get exposure to that. So imagine now if Satoshi sends a one Satoshi transaction from his address to one of these sites. Like he links back. Uh, the value of this, like the. Um, Bitcoin value of this transaction will be very low, just a few satoshis, a couple cents. Uh, but the ec economic value in terms of attention and reputation for the site that was linked by uh, Satoshi, you know, it's, it's huge. So this is the attention and reputation that can be traded in this way. Okay, but so this, this, this I, I guess how this works, so you, you have a a way of attaching data to a transaction, which only exists in blockchain.info, but let's say it's generalized. Let's yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say you can, it's like generalized in the protocol and you can see it on the ledger. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's any it's block, on the ledger. Um, yeah. Any block explorer can read it. Uh, that still lives uh, uh, aside of the content. It doesn't exist in the content. And if you want to advertise something, for instance, because that's what people try to do, right, with content is they, they want to get attention in order to be able to push products and services through advertising. Uh, if you do that, it still lives on a side of the content. It doesn't live in the content. You still have to go and, and find it. Um, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me how, yeah, yeah. how that's valuable for someone trying to publish some sort of message or advertise some service or product. Yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, um, the discovery, uh, 
like the blockchain becomes maybe it's very slowly and that's not visible to everyone yet but these behaviors uh, show us like you know people sending links to satoshi or there if there is a kind of uh, um, silk road seized coins address and it's being advertised on reddit and suddenly people start sending uh, messages <laughs> you know start sending transactions i'm saying blockchain.info because they have this public uh, node feature people are just basically using that um, what I'm saying is that blockchain becomes a discovery layer for content. And discovery is everything. Like, you know, who owns discovery, uh, you know, makes money. Mm. So that's why, of course, like the web is open, but Google owns uh, discovery uh, and Google makes money because, like, you know, everybody's going to Google and, you know, to find websites. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, by using these addresses uh, and by using identity, which is not tied to any uh, particular service and the, the blockchain identity will be able to send and receive transactions and these transactions will have some metadata attached to them, we can start thinking about the protocols where basically likes and links and uh, subscribes uh, are the same kind of you know, first class citizens as value. So the value can be transmitted in the same way the you know, likes are transmitted. And we can build all sorts of, I know it sounds very abstract because you know, uh, all sorts of applications could be built on top. Uh, the observation is that you know, we can have attention and reputation and value traveling on the same network. Uh, because right now it's not the case. I have, I have sort of an imagination coming and maybe, maybe, that, maybe that helps clarify or maybe it leads to a different question. So, um, so, so let's, let's take epicenter Bitcoin itself, right? Um, what epicenter Bitcoin, like as a, as a rational economic agent wants is, is to maximize the views, right? Like how many people are going to see the sum, the totality of all the content we have produced over time, right? Now, now whenever we release an episode, I always see that Sebastian for example, goes to LinkedIn and there's a Bitcoin P2P currency group and he posts in, on that group that, you know, this video from us came out. Now, what, what Sebastian has really done is he took like our, our, the address of our video and created a link to this address of uh, this LinkedIn group, basically. Man, so, that, that, that didn't do anything. Buffer just does all that automatically. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it, just, it just goes all right, there. All right. So, so basically, you can think of uh, like like you can think of it as as a link between these two things. Now, now, wh why do we do it fundamentally? We do it because in the hope that perhaps there's some other guy who's who is going to discover our content based on some conversation that happened on that post in LinkedIn. Yeah. Right. So, so this link. Is kind of a generator for us like you yes. know, this link allows us to generate uh, a path a road from which new users can come to our content yes right and and for epicenter bitcoin it's just just not this one link but like for every video we are creating a lot of different links mm -hmm. and then we are also linking the videos to each other so say we might you know do a set of videos on say zero knowledge proofs Yes. And these videos, you know, depend on each other. So yes. if somebody sees one video, then automatically we say in the description that, you know, see this other video if, uh, if you like this one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all our content is also linked. Mm -hmm. And all our content is linked to things in tweet, happening on Twitter, things happening on LinkedIn, things happening on Facebook, etc. Yes. So in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very rough sense, like we are, you can imagine it as like spiders trying to build this web. Yes. Right. And the better a web we build, the more people can come to us. Yes. Right? Now, what, what you are saying essentially is um, that today, like we have this link structure, not only Epicenter Bitcoin, but each content creator has this link structure. Yes. But this link structure is uh, owned by the platform, maybe Google search or, uh, or LinkedIn. Exactly, and that's the most valuable thing this platform own, <laughs> because you can take out your content and copy it, but the, only these platforms can see the full picture of this social graph that's being built. And unless we can 
build the alternative, which is open and transparent. Uh, take basically use uh, the existing uh, reputation model and reputation system, and build in parallel start start building something on the transparent public ledger, the blockchain, whether that's the Bitcoin blockchain or some other blockchain, and then we can start replicating that. But what we have on the Bitcoin blockchain is that we start, we have the same linking capability. Uh, maybe not as scalable as on the centralized platforms, but we also have immutability. So you can always see what happened and the history kind of be changed. Uh, and we have value. So suddenly links can transmit value. Uh, on Facebook, uh, you know, the dollars are on the separate network <laughs> and the likes are visible, uh, but there is no value which is traveling in the system, like, you know, the monetary value. There is a reputational value and there is attention. Um, so what I'm saying is that basically right now Epicenter Bitcoin has all these identities uh, within the system, like all these identities on all these different platforms and your ability to get monetary value for your work, but basically your ability to uh, exchange reputation and attention for money is limited by what the platform operator allows you. Uh, because you know, on YouTube, you will be able to do AdSense, on uh, iTunes, you'll be uh, doing subscriptions, and so on and so forth. Uh, but you don't, it, you're, you're limited by that. So imagine that, you know, suddenly there is epicenter Bitcoin identity on, uh, let's say, on Ethereum, and suddenly we can start receiving uh, links uh, along with money, on the blockchain, basically on, in, on the link structure that you control. Uh, because we are focused right now in the kind of the, the narrative that we have around content in the blockchain space is that we should own our content. What, what I'm saying is that we should own the links that are pointing to our content because this is where the value is. Because all the reputation systems and the discovery models which will be built on top of that will have to be built on top of the link structure because this is this is the reputation system that you have. Uh, okay, I, I think I start to get it. So, so w one of the statements that you made on, on your blog is that Google Bank is the central is the central bank of links. And yes, and, and when you describe this type of link structure, you basically have several central banks, like you have Google and PageRank, yes, and, and yes. you have the YouTube and SoundCloud, or you know all these models that we've been talking about. So what you're saying is, as content producers, need to own the link the link structure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so then they own the link structure, but <clears throat> that's still, to me, there's there's still a piece missing, which is the user interface part, right? Like yeah. Google has the search results page. Facebook yes. has a feed. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube has suggested videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you, because you can't have one without the other. You can't have the link structure without the discovery interface. Uh, actually, you like or can you? You you can. <laughs> actually, you can. Uh, it's uh, of course like uh, the only way we've seen uh, this combined was like because when you look at Facebook, uh, you don't think about like the infrastructure, the database, the reputation system, and the discovery model. These are these all are combined. But you know what decentralization is doing is what's going to be happening is all these components will be unbundled. unbundled. Uh, so once you have, so imagine that uh, Facebook uh, open, like Facebook graph is available to you, not via an API that just gives you part of the picture. Uh, it's available. So everybody can build, um, so, the so for instance, Buffer can compete with Facebook uh, in providing a better interface. Uh, and if Buffer provides a better inter interface, they suddenly, uh, you know, control attention <laughs> and suddenly they start making money. Uh, so imagine with Google, like imagine if everybody would have access uh, to Google's uh, graph of the web <laughs> uh, and everybody could build a better Google. Uh, so like with a blockchain, we have the full picture, like everybody can build a wallet, everybody can build a blockchain explorer. Uh, what I'm basically saying is that what's, like you can, take the blockchain explorers analogy and apply this to discovery and future interfaces for future social platforms. They will be like blockchain explorers. Every blockchain, like the blockchain explorer will have to give you the same kind of 
view of the system because they want to provide the objective view of the blockchain. But imagine blockchain explorers with various ranking systems. So at the end, you control your links, like you control your wallet, <laughs> but uh, you will use the blockchain explorer, uh, which provides you the best return on your attention, and you'll be discovering um, other content through these other interfaces. So suddenly, you control the links, uh, and you have a marketplace of interfaces. Uh, I don't know if that's clearer now, because this, because of the unbundling, you cannot have the interface tied to the uh, to the link structure. No, it, it, it does make a lot more sense now. Now the question is, you know, these these block explorers or content delivery platforms mm -hmm. that would show the objective view of what this link structure is, how how would they monetize? That's, that's I guess that's another question. Um, now, so they will never show the objective view. The objective view is only in the Bitcoin's case. Like Facebook never shows you the objective view of the Facebook database. They always show you kind of the subjective view, which is um, tailored to your preferences on Facebook. Reddit uh, shows you a different view, which is based on some other ranking system. Um, and uh, you know, Snapchat will use a different, like you know, Twitter is objective in the sense that you know, there is a timeline and everything is ordered by time. So you have all these ranking systems and all these, like the difference between Twitter, between Twitter and Facebook essentially is just uh, the interface. You know, well, Twitter is changing too. You know, Twitter also has an algorithm now which pushes yeah. content yeah. up yeah. in ways. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but in this system, you could have an open market for, for these interfaces. You know, you own the links, <laughs> you own the you own the underlying uh, uh, the objective layer, but the competition is on the subjective layer uh, because you can never look at the entire blockchain. You can never look at the entire Facebook. Yeah, you know, the system can be decentralized, but we as humans are centralized. You can only look <laughs> at one thing at a certain time. So, and we we will never be able to go beyond that. You know, decentralization is the future of a system. But the, you can always discover stuff, you know, through a certain interface. Um, and that's where the value is. Like, where attention goes, the money follows. Today's magic word is attention. A-T-T-E-N-T-I-O-N. -T -T Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Let's kind of kind of recap and like kind kind of summarize uh, summarize what 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 we have covered because it's it's important. So what you're saying is in, in in any platform, let's take the example of Facebook. Uh, in Facebook, I have an identity, and um, I have I have content that I've created, and this content is linked to other people. What other people have have done, right? Like if somebody posts something. And then I, I comment on it. So you can imagine it as like me creating content that is linked to something that was created by somebody else, which links to say a video, YouTube video created by something else, mm -hmm. somebody else. So what all of the web is, is essentially what you're saying is, is these links of content and identities yes. from and to each other, right? Yes. And now what you're saying is there is an objective reality, which is, the link structure as it is in Facebook's database. Mm -hmm. And then there's a subjective view for each viewer. So, yes. so, so Facebook owns this, has knowledge of what the link structure is of all of this content that it is on its platform. It sits in its database. Yeah. And then when say, let's say Sebastian newly joins Facebook, Facebook creates a feed for Sebastian. Yes. But it is giving like a subjective view into this link structure to to so it's like um, it's like you can imagine it like uh, there's the microscopic world and then there's a microscope that allows you to see it so yeah. what what is happening is like the microscopic world is like you know this link structure that facebook owns but not only does it own that link structure but it also owns the microscopes through which you can see that yes uh, that that link structure or the devices through which you can see that graph of content, right? And this uh, microscope, this discovery model is optimized um, in a way that uh, the, the, the objective is to keep you engaged in Facebook. 
<laughs> because like if you are engaged in Facebook, this is how Facebook makes money. Uh, so it has to be optimizing. Uh, so if you have a lot of like viral content and it's like people are clicking and sharing stories that are sensational, but it's like it, it keeps them, um, it's in the interest of Facebook, but it's not in, really in the interest of users uh, because the return on attention they're getting in this model is lower um, than it would be in some kind of other model where there is no Facebook in the middle. Everything is optimized. So the, your, your attention is optimized in a different way. Uh, okay. And now you, what you're saying in, in essence is what if this link structure was on built on Bitcoin, you know? like Or, or the blockchain, possibly Bitcoin is maybe not too, like not that scalable uh, to build something like that. Uh, you know, I would go even further. I would say it's already being kind of built naturally. Uh, of course... Um, and, and this is what uh, the kind of chain analytics companies are doing. Uh, of course, they're kind of at the same time, you know, maybe destroying the fungibility of Bitcoin uh, because, yeah, if you can assign certain identities and see like, you know, so they're basically building reputation systems uh, for Bitcoin uh, for compliance reasons, of course, and then they're selling it to banks. But if you take a different perspective, uh, you could... If you could have content in this, like, you know, links between Bitcoin transactions, you could build a discovery model on top of that, <laughs> in which people would own these links, <laughs> own the, their identities, and they could plug into different um, interfaces. So, for instance, like from the per perspective of the user would be, you know, uh, I can take uh, my Twitter <laughs> history and plug into Facebook and or plug into you know, uh, whatever new social media platform comes up and social media platforms would be essentially interfaces and the barrier to entry would be really low. So you just, you just create a better interface <laughs> and attract uh, users. So in a way, like, you know, with YouTube, like, you know, in the past, everybody could be like, you know, to, to broadcast video to millions of people, uh, the barrier to entry was huge. Like you, 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 would have, you would have to have like, you know, uh, the equipment and the, the legal issues would have to be sorted out. Right now, you can do it on YouTube for free, like as we're doing it right now. Uh, if this evolves in a way that I'm seeing this, uh, the same will happen to kind of Google and Facebook. Right? <laughs> you will uh, like creating new Google or creating new Facebook if you have the public. Uh, ledger with all the social transactions on it will be just creating a new interface uh, and everybody can switch immediately <laughs> like you can switch a channel on youtube you have a new youtuber who's coming up with a new new content and people can start watching him immediately and uh, you know uh, the cost is negligible so, so 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 in this world in this world where there's the uh, the link structure is open and then there are explorers built on top and anybody can build an explorer for cheap Mm -hmm. What does what do business models look like? Uh, how how does the market between advertiser, content creator get changed in this model? Uh, actually, the basic principles I'd say they're, they're the same. You know, it's like the attention, reputation, and money are uh, are these essential scarcities that have been with us for centuries. Uh, just the platforms and the underlying technologies change. So it's, it's the same, you know, Bitcoin made me think about that. Like you know, the essential value of money was always the same, this abstract value. You know, we had, we had shells, then we had, you know, fiat currencies, we had gold. Uh, now we have Bitcoin and it all represents the same value, but it uses a different medium. So essentially, this wouldn't change. But what would change is that because we have suddenly, suddenly you have the objective time. What the blockchains give us uh, and the centralized platforms don't give us uh, is the concept of the objective time. Uh, right now, for instance, uh, the time is locked uh, to specific platforms. So for instance, you cannot say who was the first person to link um, to Justin Bieber. Like, who discovered Justin Bieber? Like, Justin Bieber uploaded the video. He was always, like, you know, later he was discovered by um, some talent scouts. And, you know, and he got super famous. But who was actually the first person to link to Justin Bieber? It's impossible to tell. Because Justin Bieber, in his digital identity, lived on YouTube, on Facebook, or somewhere else, on a WordPress blog. <laughs> and you didn't have the objective time. 
with the blockchains, we can always tell, you know, who was the first uh, to link to someone, to send a transaction, to pay for, for something. So you can imagine that uh, um, some kind of speculative models can emerge. Uh, like right now, uh, you know, I'm basically saying that, you know, speculation is one of the killer apps of, of cryptos. Like people love to speculate, people are always speculating. And so imagine that if you could speculate uh, you can invest money in someone, like, you know, uh, imagine you're the per first person who discovered Justin Bieber, so, like, and you are the first person that links to him, um, and then he gets big, and everybody looks at the blockchain as the canonical reference of, you know, what happened, so suddenly you get big, you get a lot of attention <laughs> for that. Um, so you could buy, for instance, like, attention futures in some artists, like suddenly you could have, uh, like, it's already happening. These people are talent scouts. People are scout scouting for talent, you know, investing reputation and money to discover future artists. Uh, so in the same way, you could have a system where, where this is disintermediated and decentralized. Uh, and, you know, I'm tipping, and it's not tipping anymore. You know, it looks like tipping. I'm sending someone a small amount of crypto, uh, but not to kind of uh, express some gratitude, but I actually like investing in a link that's gonna stay there. Um, and if they get big, the discovery model will emerge uh, in which, you know, I will be ranking really high because, you know, I'm the first <laughs> in the objective history of time. I'm the first person who linked to them. I don't know, does it make sense? I know it sounds very abstract, but the... It, it does make sense theoretically. I, I understand the speculative model behind it. However, I don't understand what the incentive is. If, if I'm just like me, like, and I, you know, Sebastian, and I, uh -huh. I happen to find Justin Bieber, and I, and I link to him. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I'm. Perhaps I want people to come to me for other things like consulting, you know, because that's what I do. But like, as, as, um, I guess, I guess, uh, the the attention that I would get from being the first to link to Justin Bieber mm -hmm. is not going to serve me as just an individual or as a professional uh, in I, my I, line of work. I would How say I would say it would serve you a lot. Like you know, it's happening. Like uh, no, you hear this often with like uh, you know models and singers. Like no, they were discovered by X Y Z. You know, first discovered by X Y Z. You have professionals who are doing this for a living. Of course, they don't do it on the blockchain. It's all. It's all. Uh, yeah, but they, they do it for a living. I mm -hmm. I don't discover artists for a living. I, uh, I like music and I may discover an artist and I may want to share that with friends. Like if, if I discover an artist, if I like, and this has happened before, like where I've discovered like this really kind of really cool 70s rock band that nobody uh, knows about. And I go around and like tell all my friends about it and I'm all my friends like it. And they somehow think that I like, I'm, you know, they, they're, what what I get from it is the reputation of being someone who likes uh, good seventies rock music. Okay, well that may serve my ego, but it doesn't really serve any economic. Uh, it doesn't have. I don't have an economic incentive to do that. It just serves my ego in this very small circle. No, so, it, it it affects like economically. This is what I'm kind of <laughs> trying to explain here. Uh, that economically, in the context of your social circle. Your reputation goes up. You know, he's the guy who was like, you know, first to discover someone. And this is what people, I would say, naturally do. Uh, like, um, and uh, it's like, you know, translating this to page rank. Uh, if you have an old website, like a domain that's been there for ages and Google recognizes that, you know, you can rank really high. Or if you get a link from a really reputable website or you got it in the past, you know, in certain Google's algorithms, this might be considered as a as a reputational signal, which is which is positive. Uh, so what I'm just saying is that uh, uh, this concept of objective time can be used to create all all sorts of uh, interesting models that are not possible right now, and these models could be based around speculating about somebody's future, like. You know, if you're buying a cryptocurrency and you're speculating on, like, for instance, Bitcoin, so you're investing one Bitcoin, like, you know, $100 now, and you're expecting that you, you know, make, you know, $500 in a couple months. So imagine if you would be linking to someone or tipping someone, 
uh, expecting that you know the reputation will go <laughs> increase uh, in the future uh, so you will not receive direct monetary um, reward but you will have a reputational return on investment you know it's because you can play with all these scarcities <laughs> Let's take a short break and talk about Hide.me. You know, setting up a VPN on multiple devices can be complicated. Let's say you want to do like three devices and you have 10 different exit nodes that you want to configure. Well, that's 30 different configurations that you have to do manually in each of those devices OS, and that can take a long time. Hide.me makes this super easy with their apps. So they have apps for Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. So you just install the app, log in, and boom, you're ready to use VPN with Hide.me. So this is perfect if you're traveling, you just install the app on your devices and say you're using public Wi-Fi, you turn on the app, you connect, and you're completely protected against hacking, man in the middle attacks, or any type of malicious activity. And of course, the apps work with their free plan. To try out their free plan, head to hide.me slash epicenter. It includes two gigabytes of data, which is more than enough to keep you protected when you go traveling. It also includes three exit nodes in Singapore, Amsterdam, and Montreal. And if you use our URL, so hide.me slash epicenter, it's going to give you 35% off if you ever decide to sign up for a premium account. And their premium account includes unlimited data. It includes up to five devices connected simultaneously. So you can put your grandmother using a VPN, even your dog's tablet, you can put on a VPN. Uh, and you can use any of their exit nodes and they've got 30 exit nodes all over the world. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try and we would like to thank Hightop.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. What are we speculating with? So if I put, let's say, like a, a, a reputational token towards <laughs> like a new artist that I discover, mm -hmm. Um, what do, what does that represent, and how how is there scarcity created around that so that I can't just create new ones? Um, are we talking about a, 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 a like a different currency than Bitcoin, or is this something that's built on top of Bitcoin in the way that you can see it? Like how do you uh, the blockchain? Uh, the interesting scarcity in the blockchain that's I think not ha that hasn't been uh, explored yet is the scarcity of time. The blocks just increase one by one, <laughs> and you cannot uh, roll that back. <laughs> so the scarcity you have is the kind of reputational scarcity that you know back in time. It's like you know, oh, I wish I bought Bitcoin, you know, back in 2011. Uh, so in the same way, you know, I wish I was the first guy who kind of liked something, like this guy, or like this meme, or like something else. So right now. Uh, there is no discovery model in existing social networks that exploits that. Uh, and my insight is that there is a lot of interesting models that we could explore here that are not possible under the current paradigm. Um, but I'm, I understand that it, um, to make it more clear, uh, it should be kind of embedded in a really particular application. And but the possibilities for applications are really endless here. So. Yeah, like like the idea itself is is very interesting, but um, I somehow feel that like Bitcoin, although although Bitcoin is the kind of the perfect thing for having an open link graph because you know mm -hmm. you can have data, reputation, identity, and money on the same network and on the same data structure. That data structure is just isn't scalable. Like you can you it it data structure grows because transactions get added every ten minutes. But it grows very only very slowly, and the data structure of information on the web grows so fast because, like, maybe you know, thousands of links are being added per second. Somehow, I feel that there's a mismatch between what the system offers Bitcoin and what you are proposing on the other end. Yeah, uh, just to make uh, things clear, I'm not saying this could be built on Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is just like the first step and it, uh, it shows us that uh, there is an emergent kind of a reputation system um, uh, that happens on, you know, on the blockchain and this is what the, the blockchain analytics comp companies are, are actually trying to leverage. Uh, however, if we wanted to build uh, you know, Facebook <laughs> equivalent, like a decentralized Facebook, 
uh, it would have to be built on a more scalable infrastructure. Uh, and of course, we could go into details and I'm not uh, competent enough to kind of deeply explore all the uh, scenarios and options. Uh, however, innovations like, uh, for instance, uh, Big Chain DB is really interested in what uh, the company called Ascribe.io uh, is doing. Um, They're taking a different approach in terms of the application because they want to do like copyrights management and uh, provenance of uh, artists' work on the blockchain. Uh, however, the technology they've built is really interesting and could be leveraged for something like that. Uh, on the other hand, identity. I think like, Ethereum offers uh, you know, a lot of very interesting possibilities for building reputational systems on top, and these are being built as well, so they could be leveraged for these kind of models. So I had another question also regarding uh, the, 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 this evolution of, of, of the content model. You, know, you mentioned before that you know, we had the web 1.0 and the web 2.0 and, and, and how things have evolved since then. We had publishers and, and, and content producers and advertisers. Mm -hmm. and uh, It seems now that what we're moving towards, rather than having one canonical source of content where people used to say, you know, uh, experts used to say, you know, mm -hmm. post content to your blog and that's one place where you post the content and then you link to it on different social networks. That, of course, has changed now. And... Um, uh, content producers lever leverage multiple platforms mm -hmm. uh, and the content lives where the users are. So for example, a company like BuzzFeed, uh, their website is an exper is nothing but an experimentation platform and they publish content to Facebook instant articles, to Medium, mm -hmm. to just about everywhere where the where, uh, content um, uh, consumers are. So essentially it's omni-channel for content. Uh, and um, so there's no longer one canonical place where content can live. Uh, it, it lives everywhere. It lives in different places and multiple places at once. Uh, in in this model, and in, in so the the page rank model, um, sort of, in my view, doesn't isn't really compatible with that because page rank uh, wants there to be one canonical source. And this uh, reputation graph that you described also mm -hmm. follows that same type type of model where you have one canonical source and you want that one canonical source to be. Um, to be highly regarded uh, and have high reputation. So how is that compatible with the mm -hmm. new paradigm of how the internet and content is now being distributed and published online? Yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm not saying that the, that the model I'm currently exploring is gonna, it's like either or, it's uh, something that's additive. It's gonna be additional. Uh, so um, what you're getting is like, you know, in addition to your LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, or whatever your so main social media channel is, you are receiving, like, you have this extra identity, <laughs> which is controlled by you, and you can leverage this identity uh, to, as I said before, you can start selling, uh, you know, ad slots. Or for instance, you can, like, on platforms like Snapchat, um, people can start bidding for, uh, for your snaps. So they can uh, start, you can start selling your, for instance, um, Snapchat reputation, uh, but you can do it outside uh, of the Snapchat platform. Uh, and, you know, you could p potentially use like oracles, uh, which check whether particular photo, you know, somebody's bidding, okay, if you post, post this photo on Snapchat, uh, I will pay you one Bitcoin. Uh, you post the photo on Snapchat, you know, the oracle transfers the Bitcoin. Uh, and, but this creates a record uh, in your reputation. Uh, so basically you can start building your reputation uh, in addition to all those social platforms that are, you are already using. Um, this is how it happened with the, like, you know, the beginnings of YouTube were uh, such that people were uploading, you know, VHS content uh, to YouTube and basically then the YouTube built its own native content. But, you know, the beginnings were like, you know, you were pulling content from some other platforms. And the same thing would happen here. It's just an addition avenue, additional avenue that you control and you can build it out and you control the links. And the incentive is that, you know, if this takes off, <laughs> so whoever first, whoever is first, <laughs> uh, if this becomes big in the future, um, so whoever is first 
will be our kind of Satoshi in Bitcoin. You know, will be in the Genesis blog or in the one, you know, in the first blog. So they will be getting a lot of attention. You know, these guys were pioneers. Uh, you know, if it, so there is a built-in kind of an incentive mechanism uh, for joining early, but the rewards <laughs> are on a, of, of a different nature. You know, the rewards in the future attention and reputation on the platforms that will emerge. Um, does it does it make more sense now? <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it it makes more sense. Uh like like personally I've I've never been good at discovering music. because <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I'm a follower when it comes to music. Um but but uh, I I got lots of blogs for you if you want. I can send you a whole <laughs> bunch of places where you can discover all kinds of music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like but like but like recently uh because the value of the ether went up and I was talking about Ether to my friends in, say, August when the blockchain was released. And, you know, all my friends back back in India, is like we, I was just talking to them, Ether, Ether. And, like, now Ether went up. Not only did I make money out of it, but what the valuable thing I really made by Ether going up is that now suddenly my view counts for a lot more. Like, you know, if I, if I, if I say some some other currency is, is useful then my view counts for a lot more so it's 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 like i i told them about something it's like i linked to content i linked to content about ether and because i did it early i am valuable because uh, kind of i discovered ether for my for my friend circle yeah, and your like reputation now is probably higher. Of course, there is no record, like so it's only yeah. like a word of mouth. But in your social context, <laughs> in this particular uh, discovery and reputation system, now you're getting you're being rewarded. But you're not being rewarded with money. You you uh, you are being rewarded with reputation. And of course, now you can go to them and say, look, guys. You know, I want to sell you this, uh, and they will say, "Wow, yeah, I will, I will buy this from you because your rep reputation went up." Uh, and this is exactly what's happening, uh, you know, on the web every day. Um, uh, however, it all goes through the middleman. So if you are selling um, ads, <laughs> uh, if you're selling uh, your like commercial breaks in Epicenter Bitcoin. You are either going through a middleman, through an ad network, uh, or uh, you're doing this directly, um, but there's always a middleman. What I'm saying is that what if this could be done in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, uh, that there is no middleman, and like in the same way I'm liking you on Facebook, I could send you value, or I could invest in you, or, or we could build like you know endless amount of different models based around that. So uh, very interesting. Like it, it, it's it slowly starts to make sense. It start. Yeah, like, I know. It's, it's <laughs> you have to digest it. Yeah, well, well, it's to me, it's it's slowly starting to make sense. I think I I just have to listen to this in interview again for it uh, to perhaps make more. The trick, so, the mental trick you have to <laughs> just make is recognize. It's, it's the same mental trick that was necessary for understanding Bitcoin. But value is something more abstract. And you don't associate value with a piece of paper, uh, you know, with a dead politician <laughs> or a king uh, and the number printed on it. It's not in this value is something more abstract. This, this just conveys this value. So in the same way, you have to think about likes uh, or subscribers or HTTP links. They just con they're just a medium of exchange. But what's being exchanged is something much more universal. <laughs> it's attention and reputation and we had that before the internet and it was always like that <laughs> and uh, attention money reputation and it it, it was always there uh, and we can separate this from the existing platforms and build the more kind of abstract models uh, uh, yeah. we can we can make a giant attention money reputation yeah, uh, network or blockchain or merkle tree basically a giant yeah. attention, reputation, value, Merkle tree. Yes, but the attention the will be like the way, like, I don't want to go too deep into that, but um, these are different types of scarcity, which we, which humans naturally recognize. Like people are competing, like, you know, with selfies on Instagram. Everybody's like, you know, go to Instagram and see what's happening there with teenagers, like, uh, you know, taking selfies and tagging. Uh, you know, there is no money to be made there, like directly. <laughs> there is money, but it's indirect. But what they are 
um, collecting is likes and followers, so it's the attention and reputation of currencies. And people want that, like, because it's a part of human nature, in the same way people want money. And people will quickly recognize what's the internal reputation system of the platform, and they will optimize for that, uh, consciously or, or subconsciously. So, uh, so is, is, is this like uh, something you're, you're, you're doing in theory or are you trying to build a proof of concept? Are you trying to raise money for it? Uh, what's the status? Yeah, so what we, we just talked about is, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand and kind of, this is the drawing board stage when I'm trying to actually figure out uh, what are the general principles <laughs> of the social platforms, like the media platforms and the... Um, and of course, the next step is to experiment with proof of concept. Uh, and I have several proof of concepts in mind. So uh, if anyone is working on projects which are related to monetizing content online, like, please reach out to me. I would love to connect with people working on the same things. Uh, but for people like, you know, the applications <laughs> uh, that are based on this model uh, should be what I'm saying, like, Tinder simple, Snapchat simple, super simple. Like they should embed <laughs> these building blocks, uh, but for the user, uh, we have to experiment it with something which is like really understandable uh, with these principles, with these principles in mind, because people will optimize for these principles. Like, uh, like it's happening on Snapchat and people who go on Snapchat or Instagram, they don't think about the economy, like, you know, attention, reputation, but they intuitive, intuitively know if they get followers, they can sell it, it's valuable. They, they immediately trade, like, like kids are immediately, you know, you know, inventing money. They don't know anything about the economy, but just it's, it's built in the human nature. So, yeah, I'm very interested in experimenting with proof of concepts. Um, and the, once this proof of concepts validate certain of these ideas, because these are just kind of certain observations that I just presented to you, uh, yeah, then possibly maybe raising money or if this takes off, maybe it could be self-monetized in a way because this would be getting attention and reputation, which could be then so being sold like immediately. <laughs> so if this takes off, this will get re attention and reputation. <laughs> I hope this just doesn't create like an, a way to monetize being an, intent an attention whore. Because that would just <laughs> suck. <laughs> you know, it's... I mean, People are just such attention whores already. If you also add a monetary incentive to do so, and it makes no, it. No, but I, I, I wouldn't. It, would, it wouldn't be anything new. It would be something right, that's right, already right. happening, but just on a different infrastructure and in an open and a transparent way. Because in this system, all the money flows are visible. Like right now, you don't know what YouTubers are really making. You ask me this question. So on this platform, you would see, like, you know, how much money is flowing, where, to whom, for and for what. So um, this is like, you know, the Facebook ad platform, mm, which is suddenly visible to everyone. Uh, what Mark, Mark Zuckerberg sees now in this model, everybody would see and could kind of base their decisions on that. So where can people find you in your writings? Yeah, so uh, my Twitter is uh, Maciej Olpinski. Um, you know, I'm at Maciej Olpinski. Uh, my website uh, and the blog and the mailing list are, is at uh, macheolpinski.com. Uh, maybe you can put it in the show notes because... Yeah, we'll put you know, it in the show my notes. My name, it's like, you know, I won't be spelling this. Uh, no one will just get it. Uh, so if you can put it in the show notes. Uh, and I'm very interested in connecting with people who are working on similar problems because um, a lot of work is being done on this uh, on these things right now. Uh, but however, a lot of people are working on the infrastructure, like more interested in the technology aspect. And I think the, mm, like the media economy aspect sometimes is being like left out a little bit. So I'm focusing, I'm focusing solely on that. Well, Masha, thanks for joining us today. It was a great conversation. And thanks, I'm, guys. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, your next blog post. I, I find them to be uh, <laughs> incredibly insightful and very well written. So thanks a lot for, for coming you. on and for the great content. Uh, so uh, to our listeners, thank you for listening. We publish new episodes of Bitcoin every Monday. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find great shows and content about Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies over at Let's talk Bitcoin.com. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts uh, on any 
podcast catcher app you might have on uh, on your phone. Uh, and you can also send us a tip if you want to do that. Our sh- tipping address will be in the show description. It will not create any types of special links or anything like that as of yet, I think. But you can also al- always send us a tip. And also, if you want, you can al- if you want a T-shirt like this, uh, you can leave us an iTunes review and uh, send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we'll get one out to you as soon as we can. So thanks for listening and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.